There has been an enrollment increase in Catholic primary and secondary schools across the U.S. since COVID, the largest increase in 50 years. Yet there was barely a mention of Catholic education in those diocesan reports gathered for the Synod on Synodality, and therefore none in the working document of the Synod's continental stage. Joining me now to discuss this and much more, founder and superior of the Priestly Society of St. John Henry Cardinal Newman and president of the Catholic Education Foundation, Father Peter Stravinskas. Thank you for being here. Father Peter, there were barely any mentions of Catholic education in those diocesan synodal surveys that went to Rome. Does that surprise you at all? Well, it doesn't because very often, as you well know, Raymond, the middle management that runs most dioceses have an agenda which is often not in sync with either the bishop or the normal people. And so, you know, they have all these weird ideas about things and they're not in touch with people at the grassroots. But we all know that, as you've indicated, Catholic school enrollment is, is booming, really amazingly so, uh, and thank God. And uh, it didn't merit a mention. Uh, and I, I painfully went through all of those regional reports. And I think I found only th three or four of them out of the 15 that mentioned Catholic schools at all. And in those cases, yeah. it was a one or two liner only. Well, in the, an article you wrote for the Catholic thing, you pointed out that um, of the people who have attended Catholic schools, we'll put this on the screen, millennial Catholics who attended Catholic schools are seven times more likely to attend weekly mass than millennial adults who attended public schools. In 2015, some 51 percent of those ordained to the priesthood attended Catholic grade school, and 43 percent attended a Catholic high school. Men who have attended a Catholic secondary school are more than six times as likely to consider a vocation, and women who have attended a Catholic primary school are three times as likely to consider being a religious sister. Now, given those statistics, should the bishops of the U.S. be doing more to promote Catholic education, especially as we've seen the number of vocations to the priesthood and religious life dwindling, Father, over the past few decades? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, this is the goose that laid the golden egg. And, uh, and there's a great irony in this. When we started the adventure of Catholic uh, primary and secondary schools in the 19th century, uh, the bishops wanted the schools and the lay people didn't. Uh, the lay people were so opposed to it that bishops had to threaten excommunication for not using the schools. And very often today, mm -hmm. it's the exact reverse that in many, many places, unfortunately, it's the clergy that don't want the schools and the laity that do. Uh, <clears throat> so, mm. I mean, there are parishes that have uh, 2,000, uh, 3,000 kids in CCD. They don't have a school. And there's been no pressure put on pastors in those places to, to open a school. Father, earlier this year, the Catholic or National Catholic Education Association reported nationwide enrollment in Catholic schools increased by 62,000 to about 1.6 million students, marking the first increase in two decades and the largest jump recorded in the last five decades uh, of 3.8 percent. Much of this increase was owing to children fleeing those closed public schools while the Catholic ones were open during COVID. Do you think those schools will continue to see that increase in enrollment? Uh, well, it's interesting that, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, the people that came for, let's say, less than noble reasons uh, have actually stayed. And anecdotal evidence mm. indicates that uh, parents said of these people who came in, uh, number one, we didn't realize how cheap the Catholic schools really were. And on average, a Catholic grammar school in the country is $5,000. Uh, number two, uh, we never knew what we were missing. And they talk about the mm. fact that having their child or children in a Catholic school has changed the culture of their homes even. Uh, pastors have indicated that these children that came into the schools during COVID, uh, number one, parishes had to play sacramental catch-up ball with them, either missing first penance or first communion, to convalidate marriages of people who were not married in the church. And it's the old principle, get the kids, you get the parents. 
Uh, on Tuesday, Father, uh, speaking at the COP27 meeting on climate change in Egypt, the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, said something about the Vatican's commitment to climate change. I want to play this for you. The Vatican city-state is committed to reducing net emissions to zero before 2050. The Holy See is dedicated to promoting education in integral ecology. Education in integral ecology. Is this the education that you think are going to draw students and parents? Uh, well, no. And what's interesting, there was a document that came from the uh, then Congregation for Catholic Education about six months ago. Uh, and as you know, Raymond, we all sort of hold our breaths when we hear there's a new document from the Vatican the past few years. Uh, but to my absolute astonishment, it's the best document on Catholic education that, uh, that has come out of the Holy See in 50 years. And it's talking about Catholic identity and what needs to be done and the presence uh, and involvement of the bishop and the pastors and mm -hmm. hiring policies for teachers and so forth. It's a superb document. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's what we're talking about in integral Catholic education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that I, I, I'm familiar with that document. You're right. It is a superb document. I want to bring something to your attention, though, here, uh, talking about Catholic identity and, if you will, the Catholic brand as you, as you go out to try to bring students into a school setting. Uh, during an in-flight press conference on Sunday, Pope Francis mentioned the recent appointment of an abortion-supporting atheist economist. Her name is Mariana Musicato. Um, he appointed her to the Pontifical Academy for Life, and he had this to say. And now I put on the family council Musicato, who is a great economist from the United States, to give a little more humanity to this, end quote. Father Peter, your reaction, what does that say to Catholics around the world about not only the Vatican's position on life, but again, the Catholic branding, the Catholic sense of identity? Well, it's, it's absurd. And uh, <clears throat> can you imagine uh, Yeshiva University, for example, in order to have a diversity of opinion, uh, brings a neo-Nazi onto their board? Uh, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. As though there aren't uh, Catholics in good standing with the church who are also good economists that could, anything that good she has to offer could easily be offered by somebody else without creating the, the confusion and, frankly, the scandal of having somebody like that mm. on a pontifical council. Mm. Mm. This synod on synodality has been billed as a listening synod, Father. Uh, so far, the synod reports and the working document suggest a widespread discontent with established church teaching. Uh, there's a focus on LGBTQ rights, ordination of women, and so on. What effect does all this... Um, I guess reconsideration have on young people in Catholic schools who are really looking, I think, for formation, especially in high school and at the university level? Well, I, I, I would say the good news in all of this is, thank God, 90 percent of this never filters down to normal people. Uh, nobody <laughs> even knows. I mean, that's why the Wait a minute. Are you saying these... I'm not normal, Father? <laughs> <laughs> Raymond, we know each other too long. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people in the pews are not interested in any of that kind of nonsense. And, uh, and that's mm -hmm. a saving grace in the whole thing. Uh, that's why the participation uh, in the whole synodal process has been such a bust. Uh, you know, less than 1% of, of Catholics were involved at any level. And uh, so, no, I don't see it having any kind of uh, uh, impact on Catholic education, certainly not at the elementary and secondary levels. And unfortunately, as we all know, at the college level, 90 percent of the Catholic colleges couldn't pass muster for being Catholic. You know, the Cardinal Newman Society has, what, 21 or 23 colleges that are really authentically Catholic. That's that's a sad mm -hmm. situation in itself. And, you know, poor uh, John Paul's. Uh, document ex corde ecclesiae was dead on arrival the day it was issued uh, and taken up in the United yeah. States. But uh, at, at the uh, grassroots 
no, I don't see people interested in that. I always, I'm a great believer in what I call niche marketing. And for a Catholic elementary or secondary school, there are two niches as far as I'm concerned. One, strong, authentic Catholic identity. And secondly, uh, superior academics. If you've got those two going, you've got a winning combination. Uh, Father, I'm glad you brought that up. What is the biggest challenge to Catholic identity today when you look at Catholic primary and secondary schools? Well, <clears throat> our kids don't live in a bubble. And, you know, we can do only so much in a six-hour day. I mean, we do a lot, uh, but, you know, there are 18 other hours <laughs> uh, in the day that they're influenced by by, tele, by uh, television, by videos, by the internet and uh, social media. And so a lot of what we have to do is a mop-up operation. Uh, and when I do teacher workshops, I say, you know, you have to know what the kids are, are watching and listening to so that you can do damage control. And also to give young people uh, the, the tools to be uh, discriminating in their judgments about what they should be watching and participating in. Um, and, mm. you know, when I, I taught at the university yeah. level, it was interesting that I never had a girl who had come from a Catholic high school who spoke in favor of abortion in the classroom. I don't know what you know her personal opinion may have been. Conversely, I never had a girl who had gone to the government grade schools or high schools who was anything but a, a virulent, vocal proponent of abortion. Uh, even screaming at me in the classroom. Uh, so those are, are, the, are the differences that you see, and, and they're significant. And, you know, Raymond, you and I have been going to the pro-life march for, for decades now, and, and who's there? It's the kids from, from Catholic schools. And uh, so obviously we're doing something right. Uh, can we be doing more? Absolutely, no question about it. And I think the next big hurdle, we created a pro-life generation through our schools. That's that's clear. But the next hurdle that I think we have to overcome is all of this gender lunacy that's going on. Because again, kids are picking this up. It's in the air. And so we're going to have to give them uh, the, the proper explanation for human sexuality and also to, to make sure that they're not sucked into some of these very, very problematic theories. Father, this past summer, uh, the Catholic Education Foundation, which you are president of, hosted its eighth annual seminar on the role of priests in today's Catholic schools. How important are the clergy in the vitality and the success of these parochial schools and Catholic high schools, by the way? Essential, absolutely essential. Every study has demonstrated that a Catholic school uh, rises or falls on the involvement of a priest in the project. And this is more important today than it was 50 years ago, uh, when you know, we had you know, five or 10 sisters in a school. Uh, they were an institutional presence of the church. Unfortunately, in most situations, that's not the case anymore. Uh, your own children were lucky to have had the wonderful Nashville Dominicans, I think, right? Uh, and, uh, but you know, that, most parishes don't have that. And so the presence of the priest, more, it's not simply a cultic presence. So, you know, we have a mass every Friday for the school kids and they see father at the mass. It's outside of the sacramental liturgical role, but that he's involved in the school, he's present there. Uh, and that's why we have that workshop. We also have recently instituted a society for priests and high school work. Uh, as you know, uh, Bishop Thomas Daly is now the Episcopal uh, Chairman of the Bishop's Committee on Catholic Education, uh, who's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful Catholic educator. Mm -hmm. As a priest, he spent 19 years in high school work as a teacher and, and as an administrator. And uh, he's endorsed this project very strongly because very often uh, there's only one priest in a high school if they even have that now. And, uh, and mm -hmm. yet there's no, no apostolate that's more important for the presence of a priest than a Catholic high school. And again, yeah. that the priest is involved, at, you know, if he can teach, that he teaches, yeah. but that he's a presence in the building, that he's available mm -hmm. for, for counseling, for confession, uh, at games, mm -hmm. at, 
at uh, dances and so forth. Uh, this is critically important, and that's and that's where the vocations come from. I I know from my own yeah. years of of both teaching and administering Catholic schools, the vocations I got were precisely because I was involved in the daily uh, lives of, of these students. Right. Father Peter Stravinskis of the Catholic Education Foundation, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Raymond.